morning, I've titled this little homily, Learning and Living to Please God. Talk about someone who has everything. Finding a gift that will please God can seem challenging. Father's Day is coming up. Typically, there'll be another tie on the rack. But you know, we fathers can be pretty creative. We are, just not in the way that maybe most women are. We think creatively. But finding a gift that will please God can seem challenging. What is a gift that you can give to God? Thankfully, the Bible tells us not only what God hates, such as in Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, but how to please God, what He delights in as well. And best of all, what pleases God is also what will make us happiest and most satisfied. Ultimately, we will be most fulfilled when we fulfill God's purpose for our lives because He loves us and He wants the best for us. John chapter 8, verse 29. And He that sent me is with me. This is Jesus speaking. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that, what? Please Him. Jesus said that He always did the things that pleased His Father. What a great example that they gave us to follow in the Bible. God did the Trinity. Tonight, today, I want us to consider the topic pleasing the Lord. What does it mean? What does it mean to please the Lord? And how can I know if I'm pleasing the Lord? I think it's a great question for these times that we live in. Why, Pastor? Because of this. Because we are inundated and consumed with such negativity, we will be derailed and sidetracked if we are not focused on the Christ. If we do not set our eyes upon Him. You remember the story when one of the apostles, right, took his eyes off Jesus when he was doing something very supernatural, right? What you do at your pools every weekend, you walk on water. Peter walked on water. And I guess fear got the best of him. At some point in time, he began to sink. And you know, even in that story, I've often thought, well, that's pretty darn good because the other guys stayed in the boat. But you know what the Lord said when he did sink? Did he praise him? Well, you got farther than everybody else, Pete. You were the one that got out of the boat, Pete. No, he rebuked him. You know what he said to him? Oh, you of little faith. And I'm like, you know what? Say that to them. They're back there in the boat, sitting there eating bologna sandwiches with hummus. But he didn't. You know why? Because, listen, this is crazy. No matter what's going on in the world, none of us have an excuse to be disobedient to God. None of us. In other words, I'm thinking, you know what, God? You didn't let Moses see the promised land just because he misrepresented you. And I really didn't think that was a bad offense when you look at all the offenses of the world and you look at all the sins that are happening, right? Child trafficking, you know, mafia murders. And Moses struck a rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock. And for that, he wasn't allowed to see the promised land. And I'm just saying, you know, I'm like, I learned a principle very early on in seeking God. Listen, you seek God because that is the command of God. You don't get to pick situational ethics and pick and choose when you want to be obedient to God. And now you're justifying why you're not going to be obedient to God. And that's exactly what we do. We pick and choose when we want to be obedient to God and when we want to be disobedient to God. It's a choice. But learning and living to please God is a daily discipline. What does it mean to please God? Well, I think first and foremost, pleasing the Lord involves discovering and doing what pleases the Lord through living in the light of the world. Living in Christ Jesus. Let's be reminded today, what does that mean? It's not doing things for God. The Pharisees claim to do things for God. If it's about doing, guys, and let's all just go get a project, and let's all go work on something, 
is that it? Is that all there is to Christianity? Let's just do good things. Let's feed the homeless. Let's close them, right? Let's, let's, let's take kids out and show them a good time, things that they didn't see. No, no, there's so much more to that iceberg than what we are trying to make it become. And so in verse 1 of chapter 4, furthermore, then we beseech you, brothers, this is about brotherly love, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ that you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God so that you may abound the more. Pleasing the Lord means doing His will. Listen, if you are a child in this room, if you are a youngster in this room, you don't get out of it either. You have as much responsibility to please the Lord God than your parents do. You're hearing a preacher give the word of God. Now, I know there's a problem in America. We have pride in America. And we like to tell preachers and churches what we will and won't do. And they won't do this and they won't do that. And we defy and we shape. That's not up to me. My responsibility is to deliver the word of God without apology for what it is. So pleasing the Lord means doing His will, and it begins with the heart of the inner person. You know, we've always talked about this. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. And God knew that. He knew the fickleness of man's heart. Even further down, and we'll get to it in 1 Thess 2, verse 4, this verse says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel... By the way, he's talking to you, Christian, and me. Did you catch that? Let me read it again. But as we were allowed of God, we were allowed of God. Listen, you don't, you get to preach the gospel. You get to live the gospel. You get to worship God. You get to receive salvation. You get that as the elect of God. You didn't earn it. Nobody on this planet earned any of that. It is a free gift of God. Salvation is a free gift of God. It cost him everything. Even Paul, when speaking to the Galatians in the first chapter, verse 10, said this, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. They are dropping like flies, to tickle the ears of Christians in churches all over this land, sacrificing doctrinal truths for the applause of mankind. It's wrong. And we're watching celebrity pastors tumble into heresies weekly. And I don't know what causes that. I've known some great men that I listened to early on in my Christian walk that are now just so popular on talk shows and different things. And it seems like God is now secondary to really what they're doing. Now it's about selling you know, their books and making articles and doing things on talk shows and creating all that. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself, guys. It's the motive that is always being questioned. So pleasing the Lord means doing His will. Pleasing God is more than what we do outwardly. It begins with a right heart attitude toward Him and toward His Word. Colossians 3.23 And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not for men. I had a great conversation in a park in Winter Haven Saturday morning. And it's a challenge to always go back to the core of who you and I are in Christ. Now, people want to be liked. You agree with that? You want to be liked at the office. You want to be liked on the job. You want to be liked in your community. You want to be liked at church. I hope you do. You want to be liked by God. I hope you do. You, you, you know, right? I mean, why do you think Facebook tapped into that and put a thumbs up on it? Because they've done studies and marketing and they they understand all this stuff. Right? People are more concerned with how many likes they got as opposed to the one like they got. You can't have both. 
You can't serve two masters. If you're going to serve Christ, then be all in for Christ. But if you're not, the lukewarm thing doesn't work with God. It actually turns his stomach sour. But are you in? And if you're in, then Genesis to Revelation have sound doctrines and teachings that we must adhere to and apply to our daily lives. There's non-negotiation going on here. You can't rip out pages of the Scripture that you don't like and keep the ones you do like. That's wrong. It's wrong. So what it does is, learning and living to please God, it's a challenge to find out what you believe is true and what is not true. And whatever is not true and what is a lie or fake in your life, it needs to be cut away. That's the chaff. That's the chaff. Now, let me level the playing field. Everybody in here has got chaff. Everybody. Nobody's doctrine is 100% sound. Best of the best, they say, is an 80%. There may be things that we find out one day, but if you stand with the Word of God, then it's non-negotiable. Look, look, I'm not God. I don't judge people. I was on Facebook, and I saw Christian families and friends that I know that were celebrating Pride Month. Now, if I really care about them, why am I celebrating with them a sin that's going to cost them eternity? If I really love them, why am I going to give them a thumbs up when they're going to hell? I didn't say it. Don't be mad at me. I didn't write the book. I'm a teacher of the book. And that doctrine is non-negotiable. Now, I didn't have the heart to get into the conversation because it never turns out well in a typing scenario. Because 1,000% of people take it negative and wrong, and you would be here with TV crews this morning and police enforcement around the church, and your pastor would be getting shot at and his families and everybody else. But I didn't say it, and I'm not complying with the world's pressure or the government's pressure or society's pressure to try to say that the God of my Bible is wrong. My God is not wrong, and these words are not wrong. They are truth and they are life. And we need godly men back in their homes. We need godly men leading their wives, leading their children, Standing up for what is truth and what is right. I'm not saying to go out and pick it and stand on Havendale Boulevard, but I can tell you this, inside your own home, of which you'll give an account to, you better make sure you're getting it right. If you don't get it right, there's a price to pay. And I don't know about you, I'd rather take the hits of mankind than the hits of God any day of the week. God will hit you where it hurts. However, Y'all ever been whooped by God? Anybody think it's fun? I'd rather be whooped by my daddy a thousand times than get whooped once by God. Because you know what? The sting of my daddy's spanking goes away. But the sting of God's doesn't. I can be free. I can be done with... I took whippings for my sisters. They would always be scared to death. I'll step up. I'll take it. You know me, I, I did the dance. I took the whippings. But we're in a world that we need to really focus on learning and living to please God. Are you there with me? Are you there? Are you grocery shopping? Are you thinking about problems? Are you drifting? Are you daydreaming? Because what I'm telling you is life to your family, and it's life to your marriage, and it's life to your children, and it's life to those around you. I am not going to promote anybody. Listen, if I knew that I had an uncle, and I did, that was dying of alcoholism, I'm not going to say, alcoholism month. Glad you're killing yourself, unk. You, you don't find anything wrong with that, guys? You don't find anything wrong with that? Is that too much truth? Am I too bold this morning? You want me to dial it back? I can dial it back. I can give you some warm fuzzies. God loves you. He does love you. But I'm going to tell you something. In case you 
have been sleeping, we are in a war. We are in a war for the United States of America. We are in a war. I'm not promoting nationalism, but I've researched. I know my founding fathers. I know the faith that they stood Nobody could write that the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, without the sovereignty and the providence of God. Nobody. Don't tell me that God was not in that. And that is derailing. And I see kids and teenagers and, and, and youth in this room. So I'm asking the question, hey, how do I get in the fight, God? That's what I'm asking. How do I get in the fight? People say that all the time. Well, Christians, you need to get in the fight. I think Rebecca's on the front line. I think Joe's on the front line with Christian schools. You know, I, I think it's important that we continue to do the things that God called us to do. But living and learning to please God is more than external because if you miss the internal transformation, you miss it all. Listen, God is far more interested in Christ in you than what you do for Christ. You're not an island to yourself. Don't, don't listen to the demons' doctrines this morning tell you you're not important, you're not, you don't matter. That is a lie straight from the pits of hell. And you quote the bald guy on that. That is a lie from the pits of hell. You matter to God because Jesus died on a cross to save your soul and mine. That means you have value, you have purpose, and you have meaning to your existence on this earth. And the only way you'll find out what he called you to do is to tap into the relationship. That's what he's saying to do. And when we, dis when we derail, whether it's in marriages or families, whatever it is, I'm promising you it's not God who moved. It's us. We move. You've got two choices. You either move toward the king or you're moving away from the king. Every day, every morning, you're either going to step to the king or you're going to step away from the king. I challenge anyone. I don't care what anybody believes as long as you can show me in the word of God that it's true. Don't tell me that you just believe it because it's a culturally popular thing to believe. And now the waves of the salmon swimming up seam are shifting into some sort of cultural crazy paradigm. But if it's in the Word of God, then I, like Paul, would say, you know what, let's reason together and let's go through that. Let's talk about it. Let's examine the Scripture. Let's talk about those things. Let's find out what's happening. And listen, sometimes it is the trial of Job. What do you mean? Sometimes you're just going to go through it for righteousness' sake, but other times you're going to go through it because Satan is a snake. And sin promotes that. Sin is missing the mark. It's an archer's term. It's missing what God intended for our life. It's aiming for a bullseye by shooting a cow in the pasture. That's a bad aim, in case you were wanting the rest of that. But learning... Are you learning and living to please God? And I speak to the theologian who claims to already know everything about God, then you should be leading. To claim that you have all this wisdom and knowledge of God, then you ought to be leading. Where? In the house of God, in your homes. We need godly men. My mother was a single mother, and that's why I have a heart for single moms. Raising four children by herself. But my mother made some brutal mistakes in men. Not one of them knew God. Not one. But those men were okay to bring around my sisters. That was okay to bring those men around the family. I'm sitting there thinking back at nine and ten, like, yeah, this ain't good. This ain't good. You know what I told my mama one day? God rest her soul. I said, Mom, I'm going to get you a T-shirt made up. I'm going to put all your boyfriends on the front. And I'm going to call it the hole in the wall gang. She laughed and thought it was funny and said, well, when are you going to print them? That wasn't my point. On her deathbed in Winter Haven Hospital, when my greedy sisters finally left her side, 
And I had a moment, I looked at her and I said, Mom, you've got some time left to get your house in order. And she looked at me and said, you asked far too much of me, son. And I said, you're the mom. And if we don't have godly mothers and fathers that are teaching godly doctrines and principles, we're in trouble. Why even have the church? Why even have the church of Jesus Christ if we are not going to be who we claim to be? Because there is a sorting out coming. There's a reckoning. It's happening. Whatever you do, do it hardly to the Lord and, and, and not to men. Now, there are several examples we find in, in Scripture. There was a man named Enoch. Do you know anything about Enoch? What do you know about him? He read the Pentateuch. He had daily prayers. He ate hummus and eggs for breakfast. What do you know about Enoch? Come on. Walk with God. Was it not true that he went on a walk with God one day and just went straight to glory? I've been on a lot of walks, but never one like that. I mean, something happened. Like, like there's a flash or, 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 I don't know, like I'm on Havendale talking with God. Next thing I know, boom, streets of gold, mansions. I'm like, whoa, this ain't Winter Haven. He just went on a walk with God. Enoch maintained a, a, a close godly walk. He had it figured out of learning and living with God, what that was about. He lived to be 365 years old. You seniors ready for that? Come on, trucker, talk to Teddy Bear. I'd like to get 364 and just stop right there. What do you think? What do you think, Sherry? We can do that. Yeah, I, listen, can you imagine the size of a cake to get 365 candles on it? First of all, it would take 10 of us to light them. In the pre-flood world, that was super young, by the way. You do know that. Enoch was a baby at 365. Let's don't go to Methuselah. That's a long time to live, y'all. You know what the average global lifespan of men and women is today? Anybody? Okay. I had 77 for men and 81 for women from the global report. Think about that. So I talked to another theologian friend of mine, names not to be mentioned, but he has a red beard. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we talk about the parable of the fig, that when Israel became a nation in 1948, this generation will not pass before the coming of the Son of Man. So if you take 77 years from 1948, what's that, mathematicians? 1948, 77 years. I know it. I'm just waiting to see if you'll do it. Next year. Next year. What year is that? It's 1948 plus 77 if you're the male side, 81 if you're the woman. 2025? That's just right around the corner if that is how it's going to happen, right? That's one theory. Just saying. Is that not worth living right and learning to live with God if we're that close? If that's true? I don't know. People always say my wife and i talk about this all the time she says people have been saying we're closer than any generation ever before it drives her nuts it's a pet peeve of hers and i tell her all the time i said but you know what baby it's true every day we're one step closer than any other generation there is a generation that's going to be existing when there is a shout of an archangel blast of the trumpet or however that works nobody knows when the rapture is happening all scholars agree on the rapture. Nobody knows when that's happening. Now, we'll speculate in those six and a half years and all those different things, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, all those things. Nobody knows. But look, here's the bottom line. Jesus Christ said he's coming back. Now, he said he's coming the first time, right? I mean, they prophesied about him in the Old Testament. He came, born of a virgin, right? We talked about miracles in Sunday school. And listen, you need to come to Sunday school. Now we're talking about how to give a defense of what you believe. Apologia, apologetics. He's just giving a defense. That's all it is. How can you defend your faith? You know, and can God trust to send somebody to you that you're not going to say some wild, crazy things to? I mean, God's not going to have somebody come who is partially, of, maybe he's of the elect, 
you know, so, I mean, people are going to get preached the gospel to. Uh, we don't know who the elect are. God does. We do not. Uh, we're told just to go and just to preach. Just go, preach, share the, share the witness. But if we're not living and learning with God, why would God use us? Look, if I'm going into battle and war, and I'm telling you as a soldier, you need to go to the gun range, you need to go to training class for medical, and you keep telling me, yeah, okay, but you don't, you're not going to my battalion because you're going to get me killed. We have to have a rock-solid faith. Why? Because when you go through the storms of life, you stand on the truth of God's Word, you operate in the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and you don't waver. You're taking the hits. Family, life, finances, health. But you don't waver. God's not mad at anybody, but neither is He going to let you and I get out of all that the books were written about for us just because we're in a rough world right now. You follow me? Are you with me? Savvy? Savvy? Say la. Bon appetit. We should please God. But pastor, why should I please God? The coming judgment. We know that man looks on the outward, but God looks upon the heart. For the Lord seeks not as man seeks. For man looks at the outward appearances. We have Saul to thank for that. He was hiding in a cart, right? And they were calling the leader of Israel. But the Lord looks on the heart. It's a heart issue. He's looking on the heart of the woman. He's looking on the heart of the man. He's not looking so much at what we do. He's looking at why we do it. You can fool the preacher. You can fool your Christian friends. You can fool your employees, but you'll never fool God. And whatever your motive is, you can try to pull that one off too. But God looks, eyes that burn with fire, looks right into the heart and soul of why we do what we do. And if it involves pride or anything about you, at the bema seat, you won't get that reward. It doesn't matter what you do, no matter how long you did it. If your motives and your heart is not right with God, it'll be burned away like chaff. You may feel like you drag three dump trucks into the throne room of God, but by the time a holy God examines all of them and our motives for doing it, you might end up with a bucket. Knowing that we will one day stand before the Christ and give an account of all that was stored to us should be motivation for our living to please Him. Remember the sinner in Luke 18? Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this, God, I thank you that I am not like those other people would thrive. Okay, he didn't say that, but <clears throat> I paraphrase. I'll give it more accurate truth. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed, thus God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortionists, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I get. By the way, that is a New Testament, Jesus speaking moment, telling the story about someone who's fasting, praying, and tithing. By the way, that's, that's just one of many New Testament passages on that. But the tax collector standing afar off would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And that is, a, that's nothing, that is everything of who we are in this room. Me and you are nothing more than sinners saved by grace through faith. If you think of yourself any more than the Scriptures... Be careful. Be careful. Romans 14, 12 says, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. You're going to stand before God. Your mama ain't going to be there. Your daddy ain't going to be there beside you. Your preacher ain't going to be there beside you. You will stand alone before God. Now that's according to the Scriptures. Now I don't know what you're planning to say. 
Because you know there are some hustlers that are going to say some junk, right? Come on now. You know there are. I mean, I, I don't want to be too long with that. That's probably why God's going to say, listen, I'll be the judge up here because, it, it, I don't know, there might be a trap door. You, they might be zapped away. If they start that, you know, ching, ching, you're out. Next. Yeah. You know, it's not like listening to sinful stories of people. I've been out on the streets, and I've heard for years their story. And I always call it putting the needle on the record. And they play everything that Satan told them all their lives. And my job as a Christian is to take the needle and rip it off the record and say, stop. Stop telling the story that you've been telling about yourself, and let me give you the truth of who God calls you to be. If you are of the elect, I don't control that. Wherever we labor, Paul told the Corinthians, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that's the Bema seat, not the great white throne, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So that means we're going to have a reckoning before God of good and bad things that we have to talk about. Now, under the blood, it's forgiven. I don't know if he's, he's going to call it out. I don't know. I'm just reading what the Scripture said. The judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9 and 10, you can study it later. Some believers live their lives as if there will never be an accounting or a reckoning with God. But there are angels recording about you in the books. It's being recorded. We will give an account of every idle word that came out of our mouths. Is it ever okay for Christians to criticize? I think if you're criticizing a wrong, a sin, right? If we're inspecting fruit. But I think there's dangerous waters there. Although we may rationalize what we do and make excuses now, one day we will stand before him who has recorded every single thing we've ever said or done. Are you getting that? You have forgot about more than you will have to give an account to in your life. You have forgotten more. I don't know what he's going to ask. I, you know, I, this is the line I rehearse. When he says something to me, I'm going to say, well, what do you think? Or he'll ask me something like that. I bet you know. Where are you going with that? You know, right? I, I'm glad I have my cognizant mind because I, I, that's when I need grace. That's when I need the blood of Jesus Christ. That's when I need salvation and redemption and reconciliation and regeneration. That's when I'm proud of the having a conversation and a walk with God that is real and genuine. Oh, examine me, God, to see whether I'm in the faith or not. Remove any wicked way in me. That's learning and living with God and realizing that that is a critical moment. And then finally, our love for the Lord, pleasing the Lord is not only to be a primary aim of every believer, but something at which we should all seek to excel, as Paul said, abound in. Nobody can say they've arrived. Nobody can say they got it, figured out, because you don't. About the time you do, God allows a new trial and a new situation to happen in your life of which you have no answer for. You know why? Because he didn't want you to have the answer for it. He's got the answer for it, and he wants you to go through it because he's trying to knock off the chaff of the world. And we say this all the time, but I'm going to tell you something. How in the world can we ever be used by God until the death of me and you happens first? How many of you think that you've got the death of you all out of your system, that you are totally surrendered, wholly adjusted, and obedient to the Christ? Not me. No, 
No, see, prepping to fast and pray just showed me how weak my will is, and it showed me how I've succumbed to the world, and how like the bride going down in that hundred-foot coal mine who never touches the wall comes up, and there's soot on her beautiful dress. Oh, the world gets on you. You may not have gone out and committed sin, but if you've been out in the world, if you've been on the internet, if you've been out doing what you do, if you watch TV shows, and you see smut and things coming through, the world got on you. We seem to be okay with that. Galatians 6, 7, 9, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh they will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Not in order to be accepted by Him because we are already accepted in Christ. But we should seek to please God because we love Him. Nobody knows your stench and your sin and your depravity and the debased mind that we all possess and still chooses to love you. Your spouse would leave you in a moment. Your children would deny you. If we were able to show everything about us, listen, we would be scared to death if people that really knew us and operated in a loving environment like the church ever knew anything about us, you know what I'm saying? We don't want anybody to know that stuff, do we? But God does. Come on, say hallelujah. And God still loves you and me. Come on. Hey, hello, is there life? Paddles, clear. You've been given eternal life and forgiven by the blood of the Lamb that even though we do commit sin, He who knew no sin became sin for me and you. That allows us to walk in a sanctified state. Set apart. The problem is not whether I sin or not sin, though it is in a sense. Of, if you're connected with God, you can't put all God in. And by the way, it's been said, the only way to keep the devil out is put more God in. And if you don't put God in... I can put God in, put God in, and doggone it, my flesh just screams over the voice of the Holy Spirit. When you read the dead men's journals, Tozer, Finney, Moody, Spurgeon, Pink, the list goes on and on. You hear honest men say about the struggle, Thomas a Kempis, the imitation of Christ. You know the fight is real. When you got men and women that are in the fight, you ain't got time to tolerate people who are trying to play games and act like they're in the fight. I'm just sorry, that's a difficult thing. When you are battle-tested, don't waste the time of the generals with private play. Do you understand that? We need real Christians, we need them now. We need godly men. We need them leading the homes, leading the relationship, engaging in solid prayer. It doesn't matter if you're getting along at time or not. You do it because Jesus is the three-chord strand in your marriage. There are seasons and times that Yvette and I, we do fuss and fight at each other. But it doesn't negate the fact that we are first Christian and that we need to come together and God is the three-chord strand that holds us together. Am I making this up? Are you guys okay with that? I really don't want whether you'd answer that. I don't care if you're okay with it or not. Because what I'm talking about is living to please God. Why? That we might abound. Did he not say in John 14, 15, if you love me, what's the next word? What is it? You know that little word keep is also found in Jude it is a word called tereo. God will keep you until the day of salvation. So who's keeping whom? Hello? Come on. Come on. Who's keeping whom? Who's keeping you until the day of salvation? God is. God's keeping you. So if you love me, keep my commandments. You need Christ to keep the commandments. You need the Spirit of God to keep the commandments. You need the Spirit of God to walk in the will of God. You cannot do it on your own. You cannot do it on your own. 
Is that right, Lloyd? We cannot, I'll give you the scripture, John 4, uh, 14, 15, uh, verse 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you, you'll bear a fruit, but apart from me you can do. There you have it. There you have it. Preacher can't do it. Neighbors can't do it. Family can't do it. But notice that Jesus said, if you love me. Can I ask you as a congregation, do you love Jesus Christ? Then feed his sheep. Do you love Jesus Christ? Then feed his sheep. Do you love Jesus Christ? And feed the sheep, the sheep of your family, the sheep in your marriage, the sheep at the workplace, the sheep in the neighborhood. And you will not, and you cannot do it if you are trying to do it apart from Jesus Christ. You can't do it. You can't do it. I double dog dare you because you can't do it. Trust me from a guy who's tried for all those years. And back to 1 Thess 4 1, furthermore, we beseech you, brothers. They exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ that as you've received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, you should abound more and more. God wants to bless our lives, listen, caveat, as we abide in Him. God wants to bless your life as you abide in Him. He's not going to bless our lives if we're not abiding in Him. Right? If your parents tell you to do something and you don't, they shouldn't reward you with a bike or a new allowance. No, you get rewarded when you do what mom and dad tell you to do. Come on, parents, right? Grandparents, that's why we teach them. A life that pleases God is a life that is full and abounding. John 10, 10, I came that they may not just have life, but they may have it what? More abundantly. And by the way, we always go to money. We always think that means money, but it's not. How can you please Him? The ability for us to please the Lord is just not within us apart from the Holy Spirit of God. It is the result of Christ's work on Calvary through the shed blood, through His life, death, and resurrection. He had to go that the Holy Ghost would come and live and dwell inside of us. And too many of us are comfortable with grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. Is it not amazing how much we justify before God what we do and why we do it? Come on, I marvel at me. You don't marvel at you. You don't marvel at the ways that you kind of spin the truth a little bit way so it doesn't appear as bad as it really is, so you don't have to feel guilty. Right? You don't want to feel guilty. That's yucky. Who wants to do that, right? So we spin it a little bit and we justify why we do it. Well, Romans 8, 8 says, so then... They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Another passage, Hebrews 13, 20, 21. Now, the God of peace make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God enables us to be faithful. There's no room for pride because you didn't get it done. All you did and all I did was cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Right? So if... If I cooperate with the Holy Spirit, then I can walk in the will of God. What happens when I don't cooperate with the Holy Spirit? Come on, class. I don't walk in the will of God. Walking in the Spirit is life. Walking in the flesh is death. No ways about it. Don't justify it. Listen, you can justify it all you want, but you will stand before God, and He's not going to listen to your lies. That bunch is over at the great white throne. We're over at the Bema. Let me give you a quote from Jerry Lee Lewis. Anybody know Jerry Lee Lewis? That's my cousin. Okay, it's not. Thank you, Paula. Listen, listen to this, Jerry Lee Lewis. Right? I'm dating myself because he played, I don't know what you call it. What did he play, Lloyd? Piano. Quote, I was raised a good Christian, but I couldn't make it. Too weak, I guess. I don't want to die and go to hell, but I don't think I'm heading in the right direction. I'm lost and undone without God. I should have been a Christian, 
but I was too weak for the gospel. We all have to answer to God on judgment day, end quote. Does that sound like a man who walked with Christ? Does that sound like a man who had a relationship with Jesus Christ? No. I think it's sad. That comes from someone who was raised in a works-based theology. Your good works do nothing to get you into the heaven. Your faith in Jesus Christ brings salvation. And out of your faith in Christ do good works happen. That's why faith without works is dead. Right? The question Paul was raising in that passage was, does your faith save? The faith that you have today, is your faith a saving faith? If it is, then you're on good ground. If it's not, you need the Holy Spirit to examine that because you bought into a lie that is going to absolutely rip you apart. People are going to be shocked, shocked at who makes it and who doesn't. I have watched on Facebook people that have embraced the doorways of any church in this city and pastors talk, and I watch them give a little flippant statement about God on their Facebook page as if, oh yeah, and now there's this little mini conversation about God on their Facebook page, and I'm like, you know what, I don't see any fruit in their life. I'm not called to be a judger, but I am called to be a fruit inspector. You'll know them by their fruit. I'm not too sure I even see a lot of fruit on Facebook pages from believers. We can please God. We can. None of us can make it on our own. We can please God by not allowing ourselves to be entangled with the things of this world. Amen? 2 Timothy 2.4, I promise I'm going to get you out of here. No man that warth entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Did you catch that? No man that warth, that is fighting the good fight of faith, entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him whom he has chosen to be a soldier. A soldier can carry a heavy pack with supplies on his back. And I got that taste through the Appalachian Mountains. And my body's still paying for that. It's suing me for a lack of support. But when the battle begins, he drops the pack so he can engage in the battle uncumbered and unhindered. Ladies, if you want your man to be a godly man, then stop criticizing and tearing him down and support him and help him to grow into the godly man that he desires to be and wants to be. He might not have had a role model for it. He may be finding his own way for it. But you're not the Holy Spirit. And sir, you're not the Holy Spirit over your wife. It's a partnership. It's an unbreakable team. The very fact that holds Yvette and I together is the fact that we are an incredible team together. We may have different styles of leadership, and we may have disagreements a lot of things, but at the end of the day, we know that we are a good team together. We did it for our children, and now we're doing it for our grandchildren. And as long as God let me breathe life, I will be an influence for Christ. We can please God by living by faith. Hebrews eleven six. 6, but without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The word of God doesn't say it is good to have faith. It says it's impossible to please God without faith. Somebody in the relationship, please live by faith. Somebody. You can be stubborn and off in corners somewhere, but somebody's going to have to humble themselves. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the children of God. I mean, if you, if you call it weakness, call it what you want. God calls it strength. He says, in your weakness, I'm made strong. Humble yourself. That, that actually is a greater attribute toward Christ than standing your ground pridefully saying, I'm right, doggone it, and I'm going to prove it. That's just a testimony to your pride. The Word of God doesn't say it's good to have faith. It says it's impossible to please him without it. Paul wrote that whatsoever was not of faith was actually sin. I know, right? You looked at me and you're like, what? He said that? Yeah, I'm going to give you the passage. Romans 14, 23. And I wrote it down because I knew somebody was going to give me a funky look. Paul wrote that whatsoever was not of faith was actually sin. Romans 14, 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eats not of faith, 
For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What do you do with that? To not live by faith? To live by our own reason and impulse of the flesh? We're already, we already know that that can't please Him. We tried that in our life. We please God by living to serve others. Strife and envy. I believe it grieves the heart of God when we Christians cannot get along with one another. When we allow the enemy to influence our lives that we backbite and gossip and complain and criticize about one another. And I say this in the body of Christ. If you have a complaint against anybody in your own church, go to Jesus and tell them that personally. That you have a complaint and that you dislike someone and you'd like God to remove them. Let me know how that goes. <laughs> because God loves every one of His children. Not one does God not love that belongs to Him. Not one. And who are you and I to criticize that one? Because before you take the splinter out of their eye, you better take the beam out of your own. And I have to end on something good. Romans 12.10. I love this. This is a great transition, by the way. Well, maybe it's not, but it's all I got to get out of this. <laughs> Okay, I'm glad you're laughing. Everybody else is reaching for tomatoes. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Esteem others better than yourself. Esteem others, right? I added another passage, but esteem others better than yourself. I believe it grieves the heart of God when Christians complain about Christians. And Christians don't get along. No wonder the world doesn't want anything to do with us. We allow the enemy to influence our lives that we backbite and gossip and complain. When we demand our rights above all else, we, we reveal the shallowness and the lack of in our own character. Be kindly, affectionate one to another, with brotherly love. James Montgomery Boyce, and I'm telling you, this is really the last paragraph. My wife reminded me last week I closed three times. You ought to be applauding for that girl, I'm telling you right now. Yeah, go, you bet. James Montgomery Boyce says, Ephesians 5, 1, that it's the only spot in the Bible where we are given specific words telling us to be imitators of God and that it is standard beyond which there is no other. In other words, it's a pretty tall order, one that is probably more profound than what we will ever know. Charles Spurgeon also said some strong thoughts on this subject. If you are imitators of God, learning, loving, to live with God, we're becoming like Christ, right? If you are imitators of God, give, for He always is giving. Give, for if He were not to give, our lives would be empty and our lives would end. Give, for he gives unto all men liberally and upbraids not. And every good gift and every perfect gift is from the Father of lights. Be you imitators of God, the constant, generous giver who spared not his own son, C.H. Spurgeon. One-upmanship? Sure, why not? Even Christ in his absolute perfection, our highest standard for living, lived to please the Father. Did Jesus Christ do that on his own by himself? Or did the Holy Spirit help him? It's a good question, isn't it? In a similar way, albeit on a much smaller scale, we strive to imitate our own earthly fathers. For us to be imitators of God, though we have to follow Christ's example, that also means knowing God and his ways. And how do we do that? We spend time 
I should say we spend sacrificial time in prayer, studying the word, and being relational with others. We must make the time to be alone with God on our own and in community with others and to know him. Are we pleasing him in all area of our lives? If not, why not come now and determine that from this point on you will, with his help, live to please him. Determine today that you will start living by faith and not your feelings. Living for eternity, not for this life. And living for others rather than yourself. Let's pray. Almighty God, nobody in this room falls more short of living and learning to live for you than I do. The work is always in me, and that's maybe why it sounds a little passionate, because it hits so near and dear to my heart and to home, because I don't have anyone else to live for but to you. And there is a cloud of witnesses that would cheer us on to run the race to win, throwing off everything that is entangling us, not being concerned with civilian affairs, to be good soldiers of the faith in the army of God. I think and I fight as a soldier who is at war with his culture. It's so overwhelming. The enemy is on every hill. The enemy is on every valley. The enemy is, is, is even creeping inside the church when you spoke about apostates that can creep in. It's incredible. It's the devil's on a rampage. But you call us to trust you to get on our knees and make supplications and petitions that only God can answer. And that's what I'll be tonight, Father, at 5.30. I will be here calling on the name of Jesus, asking, Lord, what do you want to do with us here at Thrive Church? What do you want to do with our body of believers? How do you want to use us? I've asked you for 30 days to speak to this body of saints, that it's a coming together. A journaling in my life, I was writing down and journaling the journey, but we want to seek you, and, and it takes humility if we're going to come before a holy God, we'd better be filtered through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our advocate with the Holy Father, our intercessor, our faithful high priest. We want to be on point, and we want to be on fire. What does that mean that you are an all-consuming fire? I know what the Bible means when it talks about fires in the Old Testament and some in the New, but what does it mean? If a woman or a man became on fire for Jesus Christ, you would turn this county upside down. And I'm hoping and praying that your Holy Spirit has handpicked a few prayer warriors that will participate in that as we seek you and as we desire to learn, to love, and to live in the will of Jesus Christ. Amen.